Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Steinway Construction Tour 2005, hosted, of course, here at Hall Piano Company. We are very excited about having this um, presentation for you. It's the first time in 153 years of Steinway corporate history that this presentation has made its way to the New Orleans market. And so it's a very special presentation indeed. Uh, just to give you a little overview of what we'll be doing today. We've got a very short video introduction, and then the uh, longer video will be the virtual Steinway factory tour. Uh, just FYI, there are three uncomfortable moments of silence in the video as it transitions between the segments. <clears throat> Everyone starts looking around like, uh, what are we supposed to do? It's about 10 seconds of dead air time. When you see it, just know that there's something else coming up. Uh, after the video presentations, we'll go through our construction models and we'll talk about some of the information that was presented in the video. Then we will uh, perhaps take a tour of our rebuilding shop if our technicians, we make it in time before lunch, which we should be able to do. Then we'll give you a little history on player pianos. Look at an original antique player and then also talk about modern <coughs> player piano technology. Then we'll have a question and answer time, anything that you might have. Uh, questions about regarding the Steinway pianos or anything that we talked about today. So here we go. Yeah, no. 
oh now we know how to make a piano that shuffle flop to buffalo. Gotta know, but now we know how they make a piano. Split you and me, man. How they make a piano. P I A N O. We'd like to hear from you. Tonight on The Genuine Article, Gordon Elliott reveals the craft behind the world's finest piano. It's all about the excellence of the materials you begin with. Even though this piano was constructed in a union shop in New York City, it takes over a year to build, and 600 employees are involved in the process. Two-thirds of the construction costs of this and every piano are in the materials used. Nothing but the best. Which is why pianists throughout the world call Steinway the genuine article. I heard somebody say that there are Steinways and there are piano-shaped objects. That's exactly right. And it has been said in this building too. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, what it means is every piano in the world has X number of strings, every piano has a soundboard, every piano has a plate, every piano has a rim and 88 keys for the most part. But not every piano will sound like a Steinway, in part because of the quality of the parts that we have in the Steinway piano, because they're handmade, and because of the scale design and how everything comes together. There's just nothing like it in the world. All pianos have same shape. All pianos have same 88 keys. But only Steinway make pianos personalized. They work with the pianos, it's handmade process. Only Steinway has so rich voice, so rich tone that it could achieve any discriminant Believe it or not, this is where the world's beautiful music begins. This is the Steinway Lumberyard here in Queens, New York, where piano wood brought from exotic forests all over the world is left outside to dry to bring the moisture content under 30%. It's then taken inside and reduced even further in kilns to below 8%. This gives you the hardest, driest wood imaginable. Impossible to work with, but perfect for the Steinway sound. That's their magic. By the way, 60% of this will never be good enough. Because Steinway relies on the unpredictable characteristics of wood, only very experienced craftsmen have the skills to bend nature in a man's pursuit of perfection. Inside this enormous clamp, a Steinway piano is being born. This is a design as old as Steinway itself. This is the reason a Steinway is a Steinway. You see, most other piano manufacturers have to make this clamp also, but they make it easier for themselves by using wood that is wet and therefore more pliable. But Steinway found a way to do it with dry wood. It's not only much harder, it's much better for the sound when the piano is finished. So all these men are like a precision drill tech to construct a magnificent instrument. How do they work? This is the critical moment. This rim is going to hold tremendous tension of all the components that are going to go into this piano over the next year. This piano is going to have about 16 laminations of all hard maple. 
he's putting a blue layer on each side of those laminations. This material is so hard, if you try to pound a nail in it, you'll have a tough time. Wouldn't it be easier to get a soft wood? Unless that sounds, bouncing off a rim made out of hard maple, your piano is not going to project. People have said it for 150 years. The Steinway piano projects better than any other. Other manufacturers, why don't they all do it this way? We make no compromises with material. This is the highest grade of maple available. Now, here's where the orchestration really takes place. This rim has got to be pounded into place, and those fowler blocks have got to now go around in a certain sequence. We're going to start at the middle. Why doesn't the wood just break? Why doesn't it just snap? Because of the way that press was engineered. The only thing that's keeping it a little bit pliable is the glue layer. That's it. This gentleman here is using a wood lever. The acute curve here. Well, obviously they've got to work closely together. If he lets go, he's going to ruin the whole process. There's not a lot of talking going on. There could be no confusion about what needs to be done next. These big bands hold the fowler block in place with the rim itself. Why don't the piano manufacturers just steal this process? First of all, you've got to use the material for a bind. That means your piano's going to be more expensive. Secondly, if you use these processes, you'll start raising the price of your piano. So if Gordon Elliott wants to start building pianos, and you decide, hey, I want mine like Steinway, you've got to get the price that we're getting for the piano. And I don't know if somebody's going to buy the Gordon Elliott piano over the Steinway. The rim remains in the press overnight. But after that, it's left alone in a conditioning room for up to eight weeks before shaping and molding begins. To give you an idea of the care and quality in every piano, the soundboard wood, the basis of the voice of every instrument, is never allowed to be made of wood less than 300 years old. And if you think that's extreme, we're talking about the kind of care that carries right into the type of glue used. Steinway cold glues the soundboard because they believe only animal glues faithfully transmit sound from bridge to soundboard. So from pianist to audience. It's this quality that America's newest generation of composers, including Harry Connick Jr., fully appreciate. genuine article, we discover the strength behind a Steinway. That's the uncomfortable silence number one, guys. <laughs> On the genuine article, Gordon Elliott learns the secrets of Steinway's timeless construction. There's a saying at Steinway that nobody chases a piano around. In other words, there's no conveyor belt or manufacturing line. No one is allowed to compromise quality for delivery. In fact, despite all these people working as hard and as well as they can, they only turn out 11 pianos a day. I love to work with Steinways. I started to work when I was a child. Steinway built the pianos for generations. In 80 years, 100 years, it's still alive, it's still young, it's always want to be played. What is this gentleman doing? He's going to lower this plate to several hundred pounds, cast iron, into the piano, and we've got to make a perfect fit at this stage. The flange underneath this cast iron frame has got to match perfectly with this rest plane where all the tuning pins will be inserted. This will maintain a good solid tuning if you do this to perfection. It's got to fit like a glove. That way this does not move. Therefore, the tuning pins aren't going to move. The Steinway piano on a concert stage, played by a concert pianist, takes a real pounding. This plate can withstand 40,000 pounds of string tension. Has anyone ever broken one of these? Before this system was perfected by Henry Steinway Jr., when Franz Liszt came out and played a performance, strings would be breaking, pianos were literally coming apart during concerts. 
Henry Steinway further revolutionized piano construction with his 1859 patent for the overstrung scale, placing the bass strings over and at an angle to the other strings. The longer length allows for lower and louder bass notes. Today, almost all pianos are made this way. But Steinways remain unique because quality is never compromised by cost. Nowhere is this more evident than in the action. The 5,104 part mechanism that transfers movement of the keys to the hammers that strike the strings. It's as if you were to put on an old glove or a comfortable pair of shoes. And that if when you push the key down, it feels just right and comfortable, the action is the most expensive part to manufacture in a Stanley piano. The hammer and the repetition is made of quarter sawn hard rock maple. It is resistant to changes in humidity and in other environmental factors. What Stanley differs as opposed to all other pianos is the responsiveness that the geometry of all these components offers. And that geometry can be customized to suit the touch of any player. Steinway will even cut the width of the keys to fit the spread of your hand. But before harmony comes hammering. Every Steinway has to be pounded. I know it doesn't sound right, but because you've got disparate elements of wood, steel, and felt fighting against each other, they have to be settled before the piano can be finally tuned. Otherwise, the settling could take place in the owner's home changing the sound completely to the piano they thought they bought. So how do you do that? Bang the keys. 5,000 times these keys are going to be hit in the next 20 minutes. It's not pleasant, but it's absolutely necessary. For kids, keep learning and not only kid, everyone, learn as much as piano can give. We cannot learn above piano's ability. A richer sound, more you learn. So, I would prefer, especially for kids, maximum color variety. That it will be attractive for the piano. Piano has to inspire you. If piano is boring, nothing to learn. Child won't be interested to play the piano. If something interests, if attracts you, you like to play it more and more. Nice instrument, it's like wonderful conversation. You learn a lot. Obviously, that's uncomfortable silence number two. <laughs> On the genuine article, Steinway shares their masterpieces. The combination of fine woods, specialized craftsmanship, and musical experience dating back a century and a half means every Steinway is a work of art. But on occasion, they create pianos that even by their own impossibly high standards are sublime. This piano, in its original form, was produced back in the 1880s we have recreated something today that many people in the piano world and the art world said could not be done. You can see here, this is all exquisite marquetry. We're utilizing mahoganies, satin woods, there's mother of pearl throughout. What we ended up doing here was incorporating numerous elements of craftsmanship. There is deep carving on this instrument, finite carving, engraving. How many man does that represent? Well over 5,000. And what are these? Those are the nine muses that inspire great artists. Yeah, it's art. This piano is not just a magnificent Steinway, but it is magnificent art. And art is what Steinway is about, even when it comes with a twist of lime. What is this? Whose piano is this? <laughs> this piano is going to the Olympics of 2002. It was commissioned by Steinway and Sons uh, with the artist Dale Chihuly. And the glass artist. The glass no, 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 artist. Cover. And take a look at the color here. That's pretty vibrant. Beautiful. It's vibrant and alive, and as a matter of fact, the sound of this piano. Fiery piano. Fiery piano. Fiery piano. These guys. 
Well, did you like that? Would you like to hear a little more? Yes. Please, these guys make the pianos all day and they never get to hear anyone play them. No, well, how something contrasting, a little okay. Chopin, perhaps. A little, okay, a little Chopin or a lime green piano. And a lime green <laughs> piano. the genuine article, Gordon Elliott has a date with a piano matchmaker. actually for the piano. Same as I'm looking for friends. Piano could be gorgeous, but not for me. I'm looking for the piano that would match my personality. Steinway made personalized piano, not just uniform piano. And everyone in widest range can find the piano that would be attached to heart. You don't call yourself a salesperson. I'm not a salesperson, indeed. I'm a matchmaker. I do spend time getting to know each piano here, and for whatever reason, I have an intuitive sort of sense in logging the sounds touching each piano in my mind, and so that when a customer comes in and will sort of describe the kind of music they like, or that they like to play, or they would like to begin to play, sort of like a light bulb goes off, and I'll direct them to that piano, and we'll match them up. How do you do that? I think growing up in a household with 26 pianos in a family of seven pianos and teachers might have helped just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of pianos. It's a lot of pianos. Each piano is unique. No one will be identical. And when you're purchasing it, you're purchasing as a bud, as a flower. And in five years it's blooming and it's open up. And this is specifically style with character. As a why becoming better and better. So Erica, each one of these pianos, you kind of know them as people. They're all my children here, absolutely. So can you give us an example of how two voices can be completely different, even though they're manufactured in the same place by the same people, even on the same day? Exactly. Check this out. This one is a bit of a show-off. You'll hear it's very forward, it's very extroverted. Can you give that to us again? This is show off. Right in your face. Bangs the note hard and early, doesn't it? Sure. And it's compared to this. And this one? Right. You're not playing that softer? You're not hitting it with that with less force? Because that really is, it's subdued. It's like <laughs> that's how we do it. That's that. All those different qualities of wood. All very fine quality, certainly, but coming from different trees. Same species of tree, but different trees themselves. And some people, like they like different pets and different styles of wallpaper, yeah. would prefer two different colors of the sand. That's exactly right. I, I often suggest to families that we all come in together, because just like if you were to adopt a pet and go to a pet store, it's the pet that comes to you that is really yours. Make it even clearer. Could you play a little tune that you think represents the personality of this bright show-off? This piano will likely go to a gentleman going perhaps through a midlife crisis that really wants... <laughs> this is the red sports pretty, piano. Pretty racy. A little Scott Joplin for him. Okay. That is some show-off. Now, the one down here, 
if you were to give it a voice, something to say, to describe its personality? This one, it? which is kind of slow and sort of velvety, I would say something along the lines of Debussy. Oh. Lovely, wow. yes, sort of a veil over the sound. There is, you're right, it's like a soft curtain between you and the sound, isn't it? So, how many different kinds of piano sounds or voices are there? How many pianos are there in the room? That's the answer. When Vladimir Horowitz appeared here at Carnegie Hall, he came with his own 12-foot Grand Steinway. In fact, wherever he performed in the world, that same piano came on stage with him. Why? Well, would Pavarotti sing with a different voice? That's what Vladimir Horowitz wanted. That voice and that piano, wherever he went in the world, he knew that you have to have nothing less than the genuine article. Built differently. How are they built differently? 
shape. That's very good. What else? Belt. Uh, I think the belt spring has leather covered mouths. Uh, okay, what else? Other than how we actually play and the shape. Anyone else want to guess? Okay. Off the okay. The violin has a case too, right? Back on the sides. Like ten keys. Okay. That's a very that, no, that's a very good point. The fact that you can play more notes at one time. Many more than ten actually if you use the damper pedal. You could play all eighty-eight if you wanted to. Of course it wouldn't sound very pleasant. But you could do it. Uh, can I hike this up on my shoulder and play it like a violin? Why not? It's too big, right? So the size, violin's what, this big? This big maybe? The body is actually about this big? How big is the body of the piano? It can be up to nine feet. So size, shape, and how we actually play or excite the strings. How do we play violin? Any violin players here? Okay. A bow, that's right, we run the bow across the strings, right? And how do we change the pitch? By moving our fingers up and down the fingerboard. How do we play guitar? Elizabeth? With your hand or with a pick? Very good. Um, so how we actually play the strings dictates the sound as well. So all of these things have to come into uh, consideration when we talk about the sound of the piano. So we've talked about the size. We've talked about the shape. Let's talk about a few other things. Now, how do we tune a piano? Matthew. You have a special wrench and you put it on the pins. All right, what are we call tuning pins? Okay, that's a good answer. I like what you were saying, and that you stole my punchline. No. Uh, that's right, I was going to say, how do we tune a piano? We call a piano tune. <laughs> no, we don't tune a piano. One of the few instruments that the instrument performer cannot tune himself unless he's received special training. You learn to play the violin, how many strings do you have to tune? Four. How many strings are in a grand piano? That number was mentioned in the video. Anyone remember? Matthew. Eight. Nope. That's how many keys. Braden, do you remember? No? Okay. Okay, 243 strings. So not only would it take a long time, much longer than tuning the violin's four strings, but it also requires special expertise. Now, I'm going to pass this model around. This is a cross-section of a Steinway hexagrip pin block. This is a patented design. It's the only piano manufacturer in the world that has this. Steinway is also the only manufacturer in the world that can afford to put it in their piano. That's why Steinway pianos are a little bit more expensive than your average piano. But what you'll notice as you look through here, you'll see that the tuning pins are threaded like a screw. Okay, they have little threads on them. And they have an eyelet where the metal wire is passed through and then coiled around. And then as we use the specialized wrench that Matthew was talking about, we can adjust or regulate the amount of tension on the piano's strings, which also gets applied to the soundboard. We'll go ahead and pass that around. <clears throat> the piano's soundboard, anybody remember type of material that it's made out of? Elizabeth? Not oak. Maple. Not maple. Philip, you want to try? Okay, Matthew? Hi, uh, I was thinking maple. Okay. The, soundboard. the soundboard, spruce. Spruce. Okay. Uh, spruce is one of the strongest woods available on the market for its weight. Okay. Now, why is strength important? Does anyone remember uh, during the presentation, they mentioned how many pounds of string tension are exerted on the soundboard. So a rather large number. No? Anyone want to take a guess? No guesses? Anyone know how much an elephant weighs? Okay, not a ton, more than a ton. More than five tons. More than six tons. Less than 10 tons. So we're going we're to get this eventually. It's eight tons. So how many pounds is that? 
16,000 pounds. The Steinway Grand Piano, nine foot concert grand, has a little over 41,000 pounds of downbearing tension on the soundboard. So how many elephants would that be? Roughly two and a half, right? Now, if you look straight back through that door, you'll see Ringling Brothers, Barn and Bailey bringing the elephants in now for the demonstration. Just kidding. They canceled today, so we'll just have to use our imagination. Imagine on that nine-foot Steinway Grand Piano, two and a half elephants standing on top of the soundboard and the Steinway Piano strong enough to hold it. Incredible. Now, let's talk about the wood for the soundboard. Anyone remember, we talked that it's spruce. You want to remember how old the spruce has to be to qualify? Let's go with Sarah. Over 300 years old. Now my kids think that I'm over 300 years old, but is anyone here sharing that distinction? Okay, Brett raised his hand. Very good. None of us, right? That's very old. When was the United States formed as a country? 1776. So the spruce that is going into production in a Steinway Grand Piano today the spruce that sits in that soundboard model is older than the United States. It's amazing when you think about it. It's also a limited supply resource because it takes so long for it to grow. So we have to have a level of responsibility when we harvest the wood. We have to make sure that 300 years from now we have wood to continue building pianos. So there's a lot of things that go into making sure that that happens, replanting when we harvest. Now what we'll talk about next is the tapering of the soundboard. This is one of the key ingredients that makes a Steinway piano as unique as it is and gives the Steinway sound the sound that we all know as the standard concert piano sound. If you look at this model, you'll see that the tapering is thicker in the center of the board and then thinner as it approaches the edges. Anyone want to guess why that is? Yeah, that's a reasonable guess. Not accurate, but reasonable. <laughs> Anyone else? Not brighter. Anyone else? Tell you what, let's look at our soundboard model over here. The soundboard is behind the cast iron frame. Now, another similarity that all string instruments have is what we call a bridge. Anyone know what the bridge does? Samuel? No, it raises the strings off the wood, that's good, but its primary function is to transfer the vibration of the strings to the soundboard. So it's a point of contact. If we didn't have a focused point of contact, then there'd be very little sound energy transferred from the string to the soundboard. So where is the bridge primarily located on the Steinway soundboard? Dead center, right? In the center of that soundboard. So, again, imagine those two and a half elephants, full grown African male elephants, 16,000 pounds apiece, standing on top of that thin, flexible piece of wood. All of their weight would be focused in that one thin strip of wood that runs in that S shape. So, wouldn't it make sense that we want to make it a little stronger where all that force is being applied? Now, why do we make it thinner on the edges? Anyone want to guess? Why do we make it thinner on the edges? Very good. It's for flexibility. Because ultimately, if we look under a high-powered uh, lens, you'd see that this piano soundboard is actually vibrating. It's moving, pulsing back and forth like a speaker diaphragm inside the piano case. It's, it's flexing in and out. So if the, if the edges were as rigid as the center, it wouldn't uh, transfer the sound as effectively. It wouldn't um, produce the sound. Somebody yeah, jump. Now, this is a very expensive process to do. It can only be done by hand, by skilled technicians, people who are third and fourth generation craftsmen. Their grandfather were uh, working in the Steinway factory back in the 50s and 60s and 30s and 40s and the early, uh, early 1900s. This is something that's handed down as a tradition. It's not something that you can show a machine how to do. 
You have to work with the wood. You have to know the characteristics of the individual pieces of wood that you're working with to know and to ensure that the flexibility points are located properly. That the sound, that the bridge is placed on the soundboard in the proper location. So that's another one of the handcrafting aspects that is very, very unique to the Steinway pianos. Next, let's talk about the rim. One of my favorite things to see, if you ever get an opportunity to go to the Steinway factory, is rim bending. At 9.40 in the morning, every day, they bend a Steinway Model D rim. It's the only time of the day that you get to see that. So if you get there at 10 o'clock, guess what you don't get to see? You don't get to see them bending the rim. But you got to see it on the video. Now, who remembers how many individual layers of wood they glued together to make a Steinway rim? Not eight. Okay, 18 is the right number for a Steinway Model D, which is the large model. How many did we see in the video though? They, they weren't bending the Model D, they were bending the Model B. Six. six. Not six. Sixteen. There we go. <clears throat> Sixteen for the Model B. Now, currently there are six Steinway Model brand pianos. If we had this tour here last year, we would have said five. They introduced a model that has been out of production since 1918. Model A. Who wants to guess what the first model is? It starts with an S. It's five foot one inches. S stands for small. Okay, I'm going to give the next one away. It's five foot seven and it starts with an M. Medium, there we go. The next is five ten and a half and it starts with an L. Large. Large. Okay, now. I'm going to skip over the new model, the model A, and I'm going to tell you what the, uh, the next model up above that is. It's six foot ten and a half inches, and it begins with a B. Big. Big. Okay, very good. <laughs> now, the reintroduced model A is six foot two. Anyone want to guess what A stands for? We've had awesome, we've had uh, um, astounding, we've had all sorts of guesses. Anyone want to guess what it actually stands for? Not average. A Steinway piano would never be like uh, average. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely the best. Now, I like that. I, I would say that deserves a gold star, but it's not correct. How about almost big? <laughs> almost big. Because it's, not, it's bigger than large, but it's not quite as big as the big model. <laughs> now, the last one that we have is the Model D. I've never had anyone guess it correct. It's nine foot. Anyone want to take a guess? Okay, you're close. Dinosaur. Not dinosaur. How about darn big? Ah. Okay. So those are the six Steinway models. We have the small, medium, large, almost big, the big, and the darn big. Okay. So there you have it. It should be very easy to remember. Now there will be a test a little bit later, so you might want to take notes on that. Oh, just kidding. This is a cross-section of what we see here. This is the case or the rim. Steinway, Steinway is the only manufacturer left in the world producing what we call a one-piece rim as opposed to a two-piece rim. It's much longer production time. Um, the cost of the materials that you have to use in order to produce a one-piece rim are astronomical compared to making what the Asians manufacture, which is called a two-piece rim. And what we mean by that, like you saw in the video, they bend the inner and outer rim at the same time. So it's one contiguous unit. To make the piano production less expensive, the Asians figured a way how to separate the two and bend them separately in different parts of the, of the factory. And do the instrument building over here, because the inner rim is really what is considered the instrument of the piano. The outer rim is more cosmetics, the case. However, what gives Steinway the signature sound that Steinway has is the fact that we have one piece rim construction. So the outer shell is not just window dressing, it's also structural integrity. Okay, that hard rock maple service, all running all the way through, not just on the inner rim. So again, how many layers on a model D? 18. Okay, now. Everyone count how many layers are here, and if anyone can guess which rim that is, you get a gold star. Who wants a gold star? <laughs> the 
last thing we're going to talk about today is the Steinway piano action. Now, I love what um, Ms. Reader said there in the beginning of the video. There are Steinways and then there are piano-shaped objects. <laughs> the similarities between all pianos, from the most expensive to the least expensive, would be what? They all have 88 keys, right? They all have keys that we push and hammers that go up and hit the strings. They all sort of look the same, same shape, basically. But it's the 12,000 unique components and the quality of the components that go into a Steinway piano that make the Steinway piano what it is. Now, who knows what the original name for the piano was, the full name? Pianoforte, very good. Now, who knows what piano means? Soft. Soft, very good. Who knows what forte means? Wow. So, in English, what was the piano's original name? The soft loud, right? The soft loud. Why? We can play it soft or loud. Why was this important 300 years ago? Very good. Boy, someone has a lot of music history. You want to jump? It was the first keyboard instrument ever invented that allowed the performer to regulate the volume based on how hard they touch the key. Rather than on an organ with a pedal, controlling the amount of air going through pipes. Um, so, very special. Now, what separates a very high quality concert performance instrument from a very basic upright piano is the ability to control the piano's action. Um, how many parts in a piano action? Anyone remember? They mentioned that figure on the video. Sam? Nope. Nope, that's how many parts are in the piano altogether. I'll get one more guess. Anyone? Fifty-one hundred and four parts in the Steinway piano action. Now those parts are made of hard, uh, quarter on hard rock maple, which is among the hardest of hardwoods available. It's the same material that the rim is bent out of, the same material that's used for the end block. So it's a very expensive, slow growth wood. Anyone know what else we use maple for? <laughs> One of my favorite things. Syrup? That's right, maple syrup. <laughs> same trees, harvested in the same area. So, the most expensive materials, but also the shape and design of the material, what they were referring to as the piano's geometry, the action's geometry, the balance of the keys, how freely the keys move, how much resistance is there. I love the way they describe it. It's like wearing an old glove or a soft shoe. It's just very comfortable. The Steinway piano action is the most obedient piano action, meaning that if you want to play quietly, you simply play quietly. If there's enough efficiency in the action design to where the hammer still strike the string and give you a very soft, supple sound. Also, if you tell it to play hard, we get the key hard and we get lots of dynamics coming out. I'm not going to pass this around because this is very delicate, but anyone who wants to see this up close afterwards, it'll be right over here on the construction model. <clears throat> okay, next thing we're going to do, who wants to feel what a piano sounds like? Feel what it sounds like. That's kind of strange, right? Feel what the piano sounds like. Anyone ever felt what a piano sounds like before? Okay? Hard. Now, I think we, how many did we have total today, Anna? What, 11 kids. Okay, 11. Well, unfortunately, you guys will not be able to beat the all-time record of 24 that we had last Friday. But what we're going to do, we're going to have everybody climb underneath that nine-foot Steinway Grand Piano. And you're going to look straight up, and you're going to put your hand on the soundboard. And we are going to feel what a piano sounds like. Okay? Come on. Lay down. Lay down. Lay down. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. 
Come on, Sammy, don't be shy. Just play around. Come on, Sammy. Yeah. 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 Okay, the year is 1900. Again, 105 years ago. My kids think that I'm at least that old, but it's not true, I assure you. Um, did we have television? Radio? CD players? DVDs? We were lucky to have indoor plumbing. Okay? But what did we have invented that year? Player pianos. Player pianos. Now, if we didn't have electricity, how did the pianos play by themselves? We pedaled them. Okay, let's see. Samuel, did you uh, step on up to the hot seat here? Did you eat this morning? No. No? Okay, well, let's give it a shot anyway. Go ahead and sit down. And Matthew, if you could, just hold on to the back of the chair right here. <laughs> Okay, what you see in front of you is two pedals, okay? It's kind of like riding a bicycle. You want to keep your feet on the pedals, and you want to pump back and forth, okay? Go ahead and give it a shot. Okay, you're going to need to pump a little bit faster, not harder, just faster. Keep going. A little bit more. Keep going. A little faster. Come on, you're going uphill. Come on, Samuel, you can do it. Come on, run. A little bit more. Keep going, keep going, keep going. There we go. Almost. Okay. Obviously, Sangle didn't eat his Wheaties. Let's give Andrew a shot. <clears throat> um, you want to keep your feet on the pedals and pump uh, rapidly but not hard. Okay? Kind of like riding a bike. karaoke machine, and the way long, and home gym, the original cardiovascular workout machine. Okay, who else wants a shot? Rosalie, go ahead and have a seat. Anyone else and who wants to turn? These are the old scrolls that go with it? These are. They are parchment paper. These are still actually manufactured today from the original templates. And essentially, um, the way it works is a, a vacuum system, and you're pumping to create the vacuum. Okay, and as the punched hole passes over the strip, this metal bar here has 88 release, pressure releases, if you will. Wow. And as the punched hole passes over that, it causes the note to fire. And when you have a long strip that is exposed like that, as opposed to a short, um, a short dot like this, that indicates a note that's being held held down as opposed to know this simply being played in the least. Mm -hmm. Pretty sophisticated technology. Yes. A company called QRS. And when was this piano built? This is a 1924 model. Um, QRS, interesting company. They're still in business today, located up in Seneca, Pennsylvania. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to where they got their name from? Interesting little bit of trivia. I love this. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, now they are located in the heart of Quaker area in Pennsylvania, but at the post office in Seneca back in 1900, a um, very small post office, neighborhood community. And there was no one with the last name that started with Q, no one with the last name that started with R, no one with the last name that started with S, alphabetical order, all right? So they said, well, they're getting so much mail, people inquiring about this product, we can't put anyone else's mail in there, so everything goes into the QRS box. So the company, which was still in the genesis of, you know, they had invented this new player piano, they'd gone to the international trade show and shown it off, and everyone said, wow, what a great product, now we want to get it and have it built and, uh, and get it to market. They basically took the name that the post office gave them. QRS. <laughs> so, there you have it. But 104 years later, they are still in the player piano business. Now, player piano technology has changed quite a bit. So they do these computer ones now? They do the computer ones. As a matter of fact, now everyone will get a turn that wants a turn to do this, so nobody be concerned. But what I will show you here is the latest and greatest in player piano technology. This is what we call a tablet PC. Anyone ever seen one of these before? It's tied in wirelessly to the internet. And let's see. Simply with the click on the screen. I now can control my piano anywhere in the home, or in this case, anywhere in the store. I have all of my discs organized in the playlist. So let's say for a little bit of Frank Sinatra. Simply open up my Frank Sinatra album, click on my favorite song. I think that's my favorite song. Okay. And now we have Mr. Sinatra singing. We've got the bass and the drums and the rest of the big band, as well as the piano. This player system is about $14,000, but it includes a lifetime subscription to the Net Piano uh, website, which is where we download all the music from. Currently, there's over 450 discs or CDs that are available. All of those are also available for download. So, you can control your piano, also open up a standard web browser, which we'll do right here and go directly to the Net Piano <coughs> website. Everything that's here, just managing 
4,000 titles. Uh, but in an example of classical, here's one of my favorite Strauss waltzes. Um, this is a uh, Barnabas Fett and the um, Stuttgart Philharmonic Orchestra.
out today. Did anyone have any questions? Uh, anything about what we saw in the different presentations or about our construction models? Big, 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 no? That evil is not part of it. The black yes. thing is Actually, yes, it is. This is what's called the, um, uh, help me, Wayne, here. I'm drawing a blank. This is the, uh, not the bell. Thank you. It is called the bell. It is it's, called it's, the bell. It doesn't add resonance or anything to the piano. What it's there for is to reinforce the positioning of the plate. Uh, the piano because there's a bolt that goes through the plate and the soundboard that attaches to that that keeps it from moving. So and so the, the vibration is uh, the whole instrument is like one unit. It transfers vibration from the plate to the rim to some degree. You see these screw holes, this is this is where the bolts go into um, what he's referring to here, different positions. They'll either go into these uh, large support beams or into the inner rim. And there's one drilled into the plate that actually lands inside of this one. And uh, that's so that when they tune the piano, there's such great um, string tension that the piano wants to flex, wants to twist when they pull the, piano, the strings up to full tension. So that this helps keep the piano straight and unmoving, if you will. Added structural support. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you very much. Anything else? We've learned a lot about these pianos, but nothing about the uprights or the spinets or those type of pianos. I mean, I know you sell those, but don't talk about those a lot. Well, uh, of course, this is our Steinway presentation. Uh, Steinway does manufacture three models of upright pianos. We have a model K52 at the front, uh, which is the 52-inch professional model. There's also the uh, 1098 and the 1045 which are different sizes, 45 they make the same factory? They do. And every Steinway piano <clears throat> is made with the same technologies, the same quality of materials. This is an example of a uh, uh, 1098 factory. Okay. Of course, the shape is different for an upright, and the action is going to be different. But um, same quality of materials, li much more limited production on the uprights. They make about 200 upright pianos a year compared to about 2,600 grand pianos. Um, the upright market is not a big market for Steinway. It costs almost as much to build a K52 as it does to build a Model S. They have to do most piano tuning with their Steinway has a rigorous factory training program. There's actually five uh, different degrees of training. And Steinway does not actually certify or authorize a technician. We are a um, Steinway service center, okay? And we have factory trained technicians here. But anyone that can has been through the RP, uh, the Registered Piano Technicians Guild training and certification is capable of tuning a Steinway. Now, there are different things that you need to know about the you know, particulars of a Steinway piano, but tuning is really just a matter of regulating the tension of the strings. When it comes to learning about the inner workings of the Steinway piano, the technician really should have specialized training. Well, I would think if you spent that much money that you would want to make sure you have somebody that... Agreed. You'd want to have someone who's been to the factory uh, training. And is there only one factory? Um, there is one Steinway factory up in New York, in Queens, New York. Um, there are two other factories that build Steinway brand pianos, Steinway design pianos. Um, that would be the Boston and Essex pianos. Those are overseas. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Just to uh, quickly answer your question, why we didn't talk about the other pianos. Of course, this was a Steinway presentation, but uh, there are pianos available from all over the world. You can buy pianos that are made in Japan, Korea, uh, China is the largest country producing pianos these days. And Europe still has a fairly healthy uh, production facility, including the Hamburg Steinway factory, which we don't talk a lot about a whole lot here in the U.S. because, I mean, our pianos made for the U.S. come from New York. The pianos that Steinway sells into Europe come from the Hamburg factory. Uh, the brief story there is that they were siblings, and uh, they actually all were here in New York building pianos, 
and in 1850, late 1850s, early 60s, one of the Steinway family members went back to Germany and started building pianos because there was a great demand for the pianos and it was cheaper to build them there than to build them in New York and to ship them uh, back to Europe for, for sale. So they built virtually the same piano. I say virtually the same because uh, the Steinway factory that we could all fly to New York and tour today is essentially the same factory that's been building pianos for over 100 years. The Hamburg factory was bombed during World War II. It had actually been converted into a plant that was building uh, military supplies and became an allied target. And we took care of the target. Uh, so they rebuilt after the war. And uh, some of the components that are built and used for the Steinway Hamburg pianos are outsourced, not built inside the factory. They just didn't rebuild the whole facility. So. Why didn't you talk about about the action. Well, we did. We just looked at one key, though. That's one of the 88 that you have there. Uh, just for conversation about the other pianos that we do offer, uh, Chinese pianos are going to be your economical pianos. And there are currently 35 Chinese piano manufacturers. Only five or six import pianos into the U.S. because those are the only ones that really are kind of up to our quality expectations. And out of those, we go to the International Trade Show, the trade show every year, and uh, we select what we feel is the finest offering in that product category, which would be the pianos that we sell under the Hobart M. Cable, Falcone, and uh, George Steck names. They're our affordable pianos. They start at $2,500, go up to about $4,500. The least expensive Steinway design piano is right at $5,000. That would be for a 44 and a half inch Essex console. And that same style of piano, it's not the same piano, but the same style of piano being made in China is $2,500. Now you don't have all of the Steinway ingredients that go into making that style of product a better product. Um, pianos from Korea and Japan are virtually identical these days. Um, there's really only one American piano builder left, Steinway. Uh, go back to 1925 and we had hundreds. The Great Depression took care of that. Yes, ma'am. What happened to Baldwin? Baldwin is currently in bankruptcy reorganization. Um, I toured their factory, uh, it'll be a year in May. And they're building very, very few pianos and they're just not really considered in the business anymore. What kind of metal is that made out of? It's cast pig iron. Yes. Pig iron. Pig iron is a type of iron. It refers to the mineral uh, composition of the iron. I don't know exactly what the percentages are, um, but it is selected for its uh, the rate in which it cools and for its structural integrity. Yes, this is a non-store question. Um, the other man mentioned the International Piano Competition, which oh. is held in New Orleans. Can the public go to that? Oh, absolutely. When is it? Um, it is the third week of July, and it's typically hosted at Loyola University. You can go to um, www.masno.org. M-A-Z-N-O. Uh, M-A-S-N-O. Musical Art Society. Okay. New Orleans. Oh, okay. Dot O-R-G. <coughs> <coughs> oh, no. That's something else. Oh, no. That's summertime. You do it on your own. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't there you go. Well, we have a little souvenir gift for everyone that's uh, attended today. And oh, yeah. let's see. Why don't we start with Rosalie? If we could, um, Mr. Brett's going to take your photograph. What we like to do is have everyone stand right here, so they get a nice photograph with the. Uh, oh, come on. Put your hat on. Yeah. Oh, that is very nice. Uh, there you go. Wow. <laughs> that is very nice. Say cheese. Come on. And Rebecca. You're supposed to say Steinway, not cheese. Not that kind of smile. 
Yeah. Where's Matthew?